So I think we are live now. And I'm very happy and very enthusiastic to welcome all of you to the public program of Staying with the Travel exhibition here in AIR Gallery from the Art and Science Center in Itma University. My name is Laura Rodriguez. Uh, I was part of the curatorial team of this exhibition that we attempt to delineate uh, the elusive viral in reality that we live nowadays. And the words that we presented in this exhibition approach the study of the virus from scientific, technological, anthropological, and even poetic points of view. So there are artworks offering to befriend the virus, exploring the logic of viral time, presenting connection of viruses and plants, viruses and economical market, viruses and human evolution. So the artists seek to redefine a little bit our position in the world uh, with the viruses, our collaboration and live with them from the logic of consciousness to take mutation with them. So in order to stop being afraid of something uh, or to know something that become part of a daily reality in the last year, we suggest to look, in, to look at it from multiple perspectives. So today in our artist talk, uh, we have Anna Riddler. Welcome, thank you for being here. And uh, we had the honor to have one of her projects in our exhibition. So I just want to mention that Anna, she's an artist and researcher who works with information and data. She born in London, but spent most of uh, the time or part of the time in childhood between Atlanta, Georgia and United Kingdom. And I could say that a core element of her work lies in the creation of handmade databases through a big extensive process of selecting and classifying images and text. And by creating her own databases, she uncovers and expose, also exposes underlying themes and concepts while also, while also inverting the usual process of constructing databases. She has a variety of interests, and I can highlight drawing, machine learning, data collection, storytelling, and technology. Anna holds an MA in Information Experience Design from the Royal College of Art, and a BA in English Literature and Language from Oxford University, along with a fellowship at the Creative Computing Institute at the University of Arts, London, and her works have been exhibited around the world at cultural institutions, including the Victoria and Albert Museum, Tate Modern, the Barbican Center, Center Pompidou, the Game, Ars Electronica, Shameful Documentary Festival, and the Lever Holman Center of Future Intelligence. She was European Union EMAP Fellow and the winner in 2018-2019, There Are Prize, her artworks had been commissioned by the Southwell University, the Photographer's Gallery, Opera North, and the Impact Festival. She was listed as one of the nine pioneer artists exploring artificial intelligence creative potential by Artnet and received an honorary mention in the 2019 in Arts Electronica Golden Nika Award for the category of AI and live art. She was nominated for the Digital Designs of the Year Award in 2019 by the Design Museum uh, for her work on databases and categorization. So uh, without any more words, I'm very happy, very excited to give this virtual stage to Anna from London. Uh, and we are really happy to have you here to know more about your work and your creative process. Thank you. Thank you. I am really excited um, to be part of this exhibition, particularly the theme around viruses um, and exploring this kind of dual nature of them, which is something that comes out in, in the piece that you're showing, Mosaic Virus, which I'm going to talk about. Um, I have done a series of work around tulips, which I'm going to talk about today, um, where this theme of viruses uh, is explored both in kind of the negative sense, kind of viral viruses kind of um, infecting, destroying, and kind of 
all those negative connotations are associated with it, um, but also the positives, because um, mosaic virus was something that actually gave value to the flower, um, which, and this is something that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the series of work that I did around tulips and discuss a little bit about um, my background, my process, um, and how I've been working with machine learning. Uh, Lara, as you kind of like, so kind of like lovely described. Um, I kind of have a bit of an unusual practice. It kind of brings together the artistic, the scientific, the academic, and spans all these different things, technology, installation, computational photography, writing, sound, drawing. And the core thing that kind of brings everything together for me is the idea of systems of knowledge and how knowledge is formed and kept. And part of this interest is kind of comes through working with technology and how they're created and looking about how well, these technologies kind of reach back into different histories uh, of science and by extension society and kind of what traces, um, connotations, associations you can bring to work by using these types of technologies. And for the past four or five years, I've been particularly interested in AI, artificial intelligence, or really machine learning, um, because although there's lots of conversations about kind of artificial general intelligence, whether machines can become like people, what I'm really interested in is machine learning. So these systems and how kind of like we kind of construct these systems and what it is through constructing these systems we learn about ourselves. And I'm really interested in using it not just as a tool, but as a way of working. Um, and a large part of that is constructing the science from the ground up, from the algorithm, through to the data set, through to kind of like everything. And because I can do all of that, it allows me to understand and share error states and assumptions and reveal the labor and the process of making. Many conversations, I think, around AI, around machine learning, kind of very much center around kind of like machines replacing humans or kind of like can machines make art. And this kind of ignores for me what is fundamentally interesting, which is about working with these things, which is kind of people and it's, hugely underestimated, I think, how much humanness and human decision making is essential to kind of making these things work. So to start, am I screen sharing? Yes. Can you see my screen? So when you work with machine learning, kind of I find that you're essentially working with two main things um kind of two main things when as part of your part of your tools you're working with the algorithm and you're working with the data set and both of those kind of can do different things um the algorithms that i use and the ones that i'm particularly interested in are ones called um generative adversarial networks or gans um they're notoriously unstable and not that well understood they can kind of, they've kind of been described or i kind of think of them as this complex iterative process with lots of different inter interdependencies well you essentially have two network one network learns to kind of you have two networks both of which are kind of like trying to kind of learn from the data set and they're often called a forger and a detective so one the forger network is looking at the kind of the data set and trying to produce imagery that it kind of thinks could come from that data set and the detective network is looking at what the forger produces and goes no 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 yes until you know it, it kind of like the forger network managed to kind of like get one over on the detective network but it's this kind of really cyclical iterative process with these two networks kind of dancing around each other kind of like each of them kind of helping the other get better and the language that they used to describe it in the scientific paper that kind of constructed this algorithm was this idea that you know, that it's trying to mimic imagery until the counterfeits are indistinguishable from the genuine article. And I really like this idea that even in this kind of the way of working, you've got counterfeits and you've got fakes, and there's this idea of truth and falseness that kind of runs through like a stream when you work with this thing. And I think it's kind of very interesting that you've got this idea that the image that is being produced is a counterfeit, that it's fake, that it's less than somehow. But because for me, the images that are produced aren't counterfeit. For me, the images that are produced are, are the real thing. They're the artwork. Um, and I just think that's kind of like quite interesting. An example of a GAN generated image is um, playing right now. Um, it is, this is actually quite old, 
in in the world of machine learning. This is this is I think from 2017, um, which makes it virtually ancient. Um, this is a video which is where the images aren't just part of photographs that have been stitched together from the data set, but it's kind of this, they're entirely generated or of what the kind of model, the machine learning model thinks it should be producing for each category in question. Um, it's a science experiment. This isn't an art project. This is a science experiment. But to me, these images are incredibly beautiful. And when I saw them, it was one of the things that made me really want to work with this as, as a model, as a way of working, because they have this kind of very meandering dreamlike quality to them, um, results that are recognizable, but not real. Because um, like, if you look at it, you can see all of the imperfections. If you kind of like, if you actually pay attention to one single square um, that show that these are obviously not real images. And it's these imperfections, these traces of process that is a quality that I love and that I want to question and that I want to work with. Um, and I think it's also there's only a finite amount of time that these traces will exist. Technology industry wants realism and embarkment in computer vision wants to minimize these mistakes. So you get um, kind of deep fake images, you know, I'm sure you've all seen the kind of deep fakes that kind of like are available now, four or five years later, um, and kind of like, that are just so incredibly realistic. But for me, as a creative person, I really like these mistakes. And showing these imperfections, because it kind of draws attention to this process of making it draws attention to the type of technology that I'm using. Um, and also because you're drawing attention to it, um, what's wrong with it also? I mean, I would talk a little bit, and maybe this is something that we can talk about in, in the questions afterwards, but AI isn't, or machine learning isn't a perfect field. It's not a perfect technology. There are so many issues to do with bias, so many issues to do with kind of like access, so many issues to do with like who is actually using this um, types of technology and why. Because, and that is important to be talking about. As soon as something becomes too smooth, it stops being noticeable. And when something stops being noticeable, people stop questioning and challenging it. Um, the other kind of major thing that you have to work with um, when you're working with machine learning, as I mentioned, is the data or the training set, the information that you give to the algorithm that it learns from. Um, this is just, this is a floral data set that is readily available if you, if you Google it. Um, usually when you work with training sets, um, data sets, they're extremely large. They're millions, thousands, sometimes even billions of kind of data inputs. And that could be anything from kind of images, words, kind of numbers. But these kind of data sets are also often also very, um, sorry, they're also often very proprietary. They often belong to kind of like large corporations or companies. They're not open sourced. Um, so kind of like, whereas kind of like if you go online and search for the latest algorithm, more often than not, you'll be able to find it on GitHub or you'll be able to find that, that academic paper that kind of created it and you'll be able to then kind of construct it yourself. But if you try and find the data that it was run on, um, that's a lot harder. So kind of, and that's why kind of um, these big tech companies have such a big advantage because they have, not only do they have the resources to run these things, um, a lot of the recent algorithms require a huge amount of compute power, but they also have all of the data in which to refine things and which to kind of like work with. And that's a huge, huge, huge thing. Having data is so important to making these things work. Um, there are a number of kind of open sourced ones um, that are used for academic research, um, things like ImageNet um, and other kind of like large databases, um, which I'll talk a little bit about here. And they're usually compiled by um, using Mechanical Turks, um, which is, and there's all sorts of kind of like issues there around invisible labor, around kind of ownership of data. 
and because they use a variety of different methodologies to construct them, but people are always involved um, at some point, either in the source content, so kind of like deciding which images get kind of put into the data set, or through labeling. So kind of deciding, is this a picture of a California poppy or is it a picture of a hibiscus? Should it be called California poppy or should it be called yellow flower? Those are all decisions that kind of humans have to make. Those are all decisions that kind of like the AI doesn't understand what these things are. It's the human who puts that on. So because of this, because of this huge human part of kind of constructing these things, these data sets inevitably come to enshrine cultural or social attitudes, otherwise known as data set bias. And kind of like when you're looking at a picture of kind of lovely flowers, um, this kind of maybe isn't as apparent, but when you kind of look at kind of when that is kind of put into practice, and this is from ImageNet, uh, which is a very big canonical um, machine learning database is often used as a benchmark for computer vision. If you look at kind of like how that has kind of come in pract into practice, if you look on the left hand side of the screen, you'll be able to see all of the categories for women, um, which and you can kind of see how it's kind of like either very sexualized or very kind of like you're just like an old woman. And then if you look at the imagery for kind of like a beautiful woman is highly sexualized, you can see how this then kind of plays out. And this is kind of like, this actually has been changed because ImageNet, because of work done by kind of um, social scientists and artists, people realized that ImageNet, what was inside of ImageNet, because it's so huge, it's kind of 14 million, I think, images. There's no way that you can look through all of those if you're kind of like making a project. Um, and people kind of were just using this data set without kind of like really kind of like thinking about what was inside it, they were just using it. Um, and then it, when people started to kind of like really do the work and dig into it, they start, they suddenly realized that it was very bad. And to their credit, they have taken it down and are remaking all of these categories and really thinking about what comes, what should be kind of in these, these, um, how, how do you define a woman in a way that isn't going to be so hideously offensive and sexist but it's it, it, it kind of shows how easy it is when you're dealing with all this large this large amount of information and when you're just when you're taking work that other people have done definitions that other people have made images that someone else has created if and if there are millions and millions and millions of them it you can you will end up kind of replicating um, the biases that are inevitably inside of it. So for me, self-generated data sets are a hugely important part of my practice. Um, either generating it myself or constructing it from an existing data source, but where I'm looking at every single image and kind of deciding it and working out where that image came from, who owns the IP, do I feel comfortable using it, all of that kind of stuff, a huge amount of my work. Um, and it, you, working with data for me becomes this very creative thing. I don't feel, I think a lot of the time people think of data as being this very sterile, cold thing. You know, you get, you th made me think of an image which is just binary code against a black screen. And, but for me, it's this very human thing. Each piece of data is a trace of something that existed. And it's kind of, you end up being like a detective trying to kind of piece together what was there or kind of trying to kind of build a world or something like that. And I really like um, this, which is from Wikipedia when I was looking up copyright, which kind of shows the kind of like the in law databases or data sets kind of are considered to be creative works because of the acknowledgement of the skill and the time and the effort that goes into making it. And I really, really like that. Um, and I think it's really important. Um, so that's just kind of like a little bit of set up to, to how I like to work, um, should play. Um, so for those of you who have not yet seen the show, this is, um, a small section of a piece, um, that is, uh, that is showing there in the gallery. It kind of looks, it's each, um, tulip is displayed on a single screen and it's a piece that is called Mosaic Virus. Um, 
it is drawing parallels between tulip mania that swept across the Netherlands and Europe in the 1630s to the speculation that is definitely ongoing at the moment around cryptocurrencies. And in this piece, each still of the film is generated using a GAN. So I'm using that technology that I showed earlier. And the appearance of the tulip is controlled by the price of Bitcoin. Um, and I made this work because I wanted to draw together ideas around capitalism value and the intangible and tangible nature of speculation and collapse. And also by extension, you can kind of start to think of those, those things as viruses, this kind of desire to kind of own these things, the speculation as a, as a kind of like almost like a mental virus that sweeps through the community um, from these kind of different moments in history. And one of the things that I'm really interested in as part of the way that I work is kind of taking an object, particularly maybe a domestic object, like a single type of flower, and use it to telescope back into history and start to layer on all of these different ideas and concepts. And I think there's definitely stuff you can do with that. I think for me, cut flowers are particularly interesting. Um, they're kind of often seen as being kind of like quite traditional, pretty feminine things. Um, but when you kind of like stop to think about what it actually is, it's this like the commercial business of the cut flower market. It's hugely kind of like, it's this kind of really dirty commercial driven world. And it's always been like that. Um, and that's kind of something that is a huge theme that runs through my work. But tulip mania, for those of you who do not know, is a time in, um, yeah, as I said, the 1630s, where the price of a tulip bulb kind of skyrocketed um, to being at its peak, um, apparently the same amount as an Amsterdam townhouse, before falling back to being the price of an onion. So it's the it's considered to be the first known speculative bubble um, that economists have kind of discovered. And it's, and yeah, and it's often kind of held up um, to kind of mirror the kind of way that kind of like cryptocurrencies also behave. Um, so you can kind of see this is from 2018. You can, if I took the screenshot on Ethereum right now, you'd see like, in a very, very, very similar behavior happening where you kind of have these kind of like huge, huge peaks and then kind of crashes. And I'm not the first person to kind of make this connection between Bitcoin and tulip mania. Um, back in 2013, the kind of Dutch central bank um, was making it. And also kind of like there have been kind of blockchain conferences also called with i can't tell if they know that they're being kind of self-referential or not but called tulip um and there are kind of major differences between kind of these two very complex economic systems um but both are kind of often depicted as this unstem this like unstable friendly doomed from the start but in my research i kind of found that there are stronger, more interesting connections that kind of appear between looking at this kind of this, the way that people are behaving around the tulip and how people are behaving around um, around around um, cryptocurrencies that and these were links that I then started and I wanted to explore more fully and that I was able to do so through the choice of working with machine learning in this piece. Um, so this is sorry this is horribly pixelated but um to kind of go back a little bit more and talk about the mosaic virus the demand for um tulips during tulip mania was partly driven by the mosaic virus um so the mosaic virus gives tulips um its distinctive stripes so kind of like the stripy tulips and um, the stripy tulips kind of became some of the most expensive tulips during, during the boom. 
during this mania. And the reason for that was people didn't know that the mosaic virus existed. They didn't understand how a tulip could be white, produce a flower that would be white one year and then stripe the next. It turns out that the mosaic virus kind of comes about because of an aphid bug laying its eggs inside the tulip bulb. And that's the thing that causes the stripes to occur. So you could have a tulip that would be plain one year, stripe the next, but they didn't know that. And so they would do kind of these very weird things like kind of take a tulip bulb, a red tulip bulb and a white tulip bulb and cut them in half and glue them together and hope that that would create a stripy tulip. They would do things like paint the ground with stripes in the hope that that would create kind of a striped tulip and all because they didn't understand that it was this virus that was causing the stripes and therefore causing the value. And it's really interesting because it's one of the only, I think it's one of the only instances of a virus adding value to a plant. Normally when you think of viruses in botany, they're things that destroy value, they're the things that destroy the kind of plant. But in this case, it's adding value, it's making it scarce. And because it's making it scarce, it's making it valuable. Um, but it's this also kind of combined with it is this total lack of, lack, lack of understanding about how it works or the thing that exists. And that kind of for me was really important in this piece. People were buying these these striped tulip bulbs and not understanding kind of like how they came to be or if indeed they would be striped. And that also reminded me of kind of how people behave around blockchain and around cryptocurrencies. Um, there's a real lack of understanding around the thing that is generating wealth. Um, the Long Island Ice Tea Company changed its name to the Long Blockchain Corporation and shares went up by 500% when they did this. Not because it changed um, what it was producing, but because they changed their name and everyone was like, blockchain, that's the future. Um, and so there's something really kind of like, again, it's this kind of mania, this virus that kind of accompanies this kind of like this speculation that you can kind of start to see occurring both kind of in the 1630s and right now. And the other kind of like quite nice link, I think, between the striped tulip and kind of blockchain or um, and Bitcoin, sorry, is that there is there's finite quantities of both of them. So Bitcoin, the supply is kind of like very tightly controlled um, by an underlying algorithm, and there's only a small number that kind of trickle out each time, and it's capped, and it's kind of like so you'll never have infinite Bitcoins. There's a certain number of them. And there's something also happening um, with the kind of mosaic virus and the striped tulips, because the mosaic virus actually damages the tulip bulb. So that when you will have a striped tulip, a really beautiful one, one year, it kind of weakens the bulb so that it means that it will kind of, the bulb will kind of stop producing after a certain amount of time, a much shorter amount of time than if it hadn't been infected. So it produces these incredibly beautiful, these incredibly rare, things, but it means that it will have a shorter lifespan. So you will never really, there was that, there was never really an oversaturation in the market because the bulb kind of like it, 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 it hurts it. And so it's kind of like they're both of these things are mimicking. They both are kind of like have this quality where they will never be infinite. They're controlled, they're tight, there's, they're kind of, um, they're kind of like constrained within themselves. And so these kind of things, these parallels start to kind of appear when you start to kind of dig really deep into how these things work. Um, and then the other thing that I kind of wanted to kind of think through, or kind of one of the other reasons why I think it's quite nice to be working with machine learning in when talking about these, this kind of, this, this space is that AI is in the middle of its own hype cycle. People kind of talk about AI winters and AI summers when they talk about the kind of how these things are funded and the attention that is paid to it. And we are definitely in the middle of an AI summer. There's so much money that is being thrown into it, so much hype that is surrounding it. There is a billboard next to my um, house that a few months ago was advertising an AI powered toothbrush. 
and that's the kind of like the the way that it's just everywhere people just kind of like if you say that something has ai in it people just throw money at it and so we're also not only in a hype cycle around cryptocurrency we're in a hype cycle around ai so again it's kind of like it's a nice way of like bringing all of these concepts together and also through kind of like working with machine learning and by understanding how machine learning works i was able to use the GANs not merely as a tool, but as another way of understanding the subject matter. So GANs in particular, when you're training them, when you're working with them, when you're kind of like, when you're starting to see how they're kind of trying to learn the different things in the data set, they have a tendency to kind of see, to seem like they're improving. And if you look at the learning rate, kind of like, it will look like it's going up and up and up and up and up and up on the graph. And then suddenly something will happen called mode collapse when the it will just stop it will just collapse and so it will just kind of like the way that it behaves on the graph when it kind of like stops working and kind of produces stuff like this it will kind of go up and then crash and so it's behaving it looks just like those charts that I showed earlier it's kind of like it's mirroring the behavior of markets in these speculative bubbles and it's and and so as a material, it's kind of echoing its subject matter. And further, another nice connection between working in this way is, is the tradition of tulips in art history. Um, they featured prominently in Dutch still lives at the time. They're called the so-called Vanitas paintings that illustrated that beauty and treasure are fleeting, which makes it kind of quite nice um, for something that is essentially talking about the stock market. Um, and how the, the kind of the way that I think this is quite a quite a nice way to kind of think about the piece updating this tradition is that paintings like this, all of the flowers in it are from different seasons. So they're from spring, summer, autumn, and they never could have existed in a bouquet all at the same time. So they're kind of like these paintings are constructed not from like a real object in front of the painter, but from the painter's knowledge of everything that he's seen before or they've seen before, everything that they've seen before. Um, and it's kind of like that with kind of the way that the GAN works. It's not just repeating a photograph from the data set and kind of presenting it. It's taking everything from the data set and constructing something entirely new. So just in the way that these bouquets could be considered botanical impossibilities kind of back in the 17th century, the GAN is producing a botanically impossible tulip. And so it's just kind of taking this tradition and updating it through the use of technology. Um, and this kind of like the way of working and also the visual was kind of a very strong um, reference for, for the piece. And because I wanted to take that aesthetic and work with it and kind of and because of all of the issues that I talked before about kind of like wanting to build my own data set I I took 10,000 photographs of tulips um, in the Netherlands um, so it's actually affordable or sort of affordable and what was quite nice is that the reason why I stopped taking these photographs wasn't because 10,000 is a nice round number although it is I stopped taking the photographs because tulip season ended um, even though this is an incredibly digital piece that is talking about the digital, it was driven by the rhythms of nature. Um, and it shouldn't also something that shouldn't surprise me that given the context, but it was actually very, very difficult to find photographs, of, to find striped tulips to photograph. Um, and kind of creating my own data set because I wanted to have them all kind of like a single tulip against a black backdrop it forces me to examine each tulip. It's a very physical thing, stripping all of the tulips, setting it up, holding it, you know, like it's, it's a big, you start to have a very, very, very different relationship with the subject matter than you do if you're just kind of like writing a scraper to kind of go onto Google and take all of these images. You kind of like, you really start to kind of like, it changes the way that you see the world. Um, and you start to notice things and you kind of like, you really like, yeah, it's this very kind of um, weird kind of thing. And I think it the process also becomes like craft. And I think this idea of craft versus art is very interesting when you start to think about the digital. 
um, especially maybe with machine learning, I do feel that kind of creating a data set, there is a craft to it. It's very often kind of like badly paid, it's anonymous, um, uh, it doesn't have the same kind of like um, status or, or financial kind of gain that kind of like constructing an algorithm, which I feel is a much more kind of parallel to like the artist in the art world where it's authored, you can get kind of big jobs with it, all that kind of stuff. And I think kind of by very much embracing the data set, I feel that I'm embracing that craft and also gesturing as well to another history of kind of women in computing. Um, Cause back in the, back in the kind of like, I think the 1930s, 1940s in IBM labs, women who would kind of work everything out for the kind of mathematicians, for the scientists. Um, who computed everything were called computers. Women quite literally were computers. Um, and they would do this work um, to kind of, and it would again be this anonymous thing that would sit behind the real work. And I think it's really important to embrace that and, and bring it out as part of my practice. And so because of this, because this kind of like work, this labor, this effort, and also this hu the humanness of kind of creating my data set, I decided to make that a separate piece of work, which is called Myriad Tulips, um, where I take these photographs, I've printed them out, I've labeled them and I've hung them uh, in a display. And this labeling is also like another huge part of work. It's a huge kind of like part of the project and an important part of the project. Um, I categorized everything, what color it was, what type of tulip, how striped it was, whether it was a bud or dying. And this is work again, that is usually hidden. It's not kind of like brought out, but I think by doing so, and also by the choice of handwriting everything, I kind of think it kind of serves to neuter this idea that that algorithmic is sterile and I really wanted to kind of emphasize the meanness of kind of like like me I was the one deciding this and also if you look at it I don't think there are any of it in this photo but like I'm always like crossing stuff out or like changing my mind about whether something is in fact pink or if it's red or you know like it's very hard um, to do because it, there it's not an absolute correct thing like it's a very very subjective idea as to whether something to something like color is kind of like, it's very difficult to decide something. And it's like hugely kind of dependent on what you've seen before, what type of time of day it is, kind of like whether you're in a rush or not. And if it's not easy to do for something as simple as a flower, a single type of flower, you can suddenly realize how difficult it's gonna be for something kind of complex, like gender or identity. And kind of like, so yeah, the entire installation when it's shown in its full is around 50 square meters. And I think it's important to kind of show it like this. Um, it's very easy to forget in a digital age that information is physical and that things that you often, that you see on a screen have always started out in the real world at, at some point. And by placing it back into the real world, people can start to comprehend aspects about the data that they did not before. If you're scrolling through 10,000 images on your, in, in your laptop, just kind of like scrolling through, you don't get the sense of effort. You don't get the sense of scale. You don't get the sense of time that goes into creating these things in the way that you do if you're confronted with them and you walk into a hall and everywhere is plastered with them and you have to walk through them. Um, and I think that's something that is really important when you're kind of working with technology is to understand that the data has a provenance, it has a history, it has a, a lineage, and that that is something that you should kind of be respectful of if you're working with stuff that is not your own. And then just finally, kind of, um, I'm going to talk very quickly about the third kind of part of this ongoing tulip series, um, which I did. So I did the data set in 2018, the mosaic virus in 2019, and then this followed on briefly afterwards after the mosaic virus, um, which is a piece um, kind of, this is probably, if this will play, probably a better, indication of it because this is a it's essentially an nft that i made i made a 
smart contract, I made uh, NFT and I made some more kind of like uh, moving image pieces of the tulips um, that I kind of then sold on a DApp uh, a website that um, and created an auction using Ethereum on the blockchain. And I also kind of put bots into it so that there were always people, there were bots that were bidding on, bidding on the tulips at the same time. And kind of like, it's echoing the auctions that kind of like sprung up at the time period of tulip mania where people were just constantly buying and selling bots. Um, and kind of like mimicking that in today's kind of equivalent. Um, and kind of trying to think through the way that technology drives human desire and economic dynamics by creating artificial um, scarcity. Because the smart contracts that kind of enabled the sale and defined the work that kind of got sold, so the things that kind of allowed you to kind of buy one and then view it, um, contain code that kind of made the video work behave as if it was a live tulip. So it would only be visible for a week and then it would get destroyed and you would no longer be able to see it. Um, and that's kind of like mimicking and bringing back the impermanence of the natural world into the digital world and also raising questions around ownership of art objects. So around kind of like the desire to kind of like play in this space where it's kind of weird and kind of very kind of like hypey at the moment. Um, and kind of like in the way that kind of like pe when people were buying these tulip kind of like um, the tulips during the mania, people just buying them to own them, they didn't really care about what they were. The way that this kind of like was set up, the videos were heavily pixelated and you wouldn't know what you were buying until you owned it. Bringing this chance in, there were bots which were also bidding on stuff to kind of like drive the prices up and people were kind of like responding to that and kind of like everything was kind of like designed to kind of create the scarcity and to kind of like bring this like create my own little mini bubble on the blockchain and in many ways I feel if I made this piece now I would be making a fortune but at the time it was it was kind of um it worked but it, it I think like the bubble is now in terms of like nfts and smart contracts and it really really kind of is Kind of so weird at the moment seeing this happen and it's like and adding bots and i think also is kind of playing with the idea of how auctions work now um at the time kind of like it was always human kind of like you'd be in a you'd be in a room and people would kind of be bidding at the same time but now so much of the kind of like financial trading is driven by bots there are all these kind of systems that are working and it's becoming harder and harder to work out where the human influence is. And that's, again, something that I'm really, really interested in. Um, then just to kind of like talk a tiny bit about blockchain technology, because again, I'm super interested, not just about using technology, but understanding how that technology works. So I could have taken these videos and kind of put them on kind of like Nifty, Nifty Gateway or somewhere like that, and just kind of had someone else do it all for me but I built everything myself because then it, by building it, I was able to put these little things in about like constructing the tulips to make them only last for a certain amount of time, adding bots onto the platform and kind of creating all of these things. So the work isn't just kind of like it's on the blockchain, but it's the combination of having it on the blockchain, making the contract self-destruct, having the bots kind of like bidding on stuff, having people bidding on stuff. So it became like a performance that existed only for the duration of the show. Kind of doing all of these things um but kind of like working with blockchain this is actually so this is how the system works if you're building your own d app and it is just ginormously complicated normally when you're working with kind of like a normal kind of like web-based thing it's just like front end back end the end but with this it's kind of like all these kind of like again iterative loops you're dealing with kind of like multiple third-party plugins it's just like really, really complicated and very, I found it very difficult to work with. In the way that kind of like I find machine learning kind of like opens up and makes you question what it means to be like human, what it question, questions about ontology, questions about knowledge, working with kind of blockchain, it's a very trustless system, essentially. It's like the fact like this idea of provenance is baked into it. 
and the whole kind of concept of it is baked is kind of based on this idea that you need to have kind of a record because you can't trust people so for me it's this very different way of working and kind of like it's it's this very kind of like incredibly environmentally inefficient way of working as well but I'm sure people who are like um, who are interested in the space are already aware that kind of like it just is so energy intensive and if you kind of look on the own documentation it says that you know realistically what you're doing with it, it is kind of like stuff that you cannot do from a smartphone from 1999 so when you actually start working with it it's it's not that kind of it's not it's it's it leaves me in a very uncomfortable place um at the time a lot of when work is being done now at the moment to kind of like work out um how to how to kind of like make it more kind of sustainable but um yeah and it's just this weird thing kind of like with this project is that I can produce infinite number of tulips um, through work, through the code, through the artificial intelligence model. But the only ones that are considered valuable are the ones that kind of like are verified by being on the blockchain. And it does again, kind of like raise all of these questions around kind of like, for me, the art market and what is the art and why is it this? And it just because you kind of stick a label on it, um, it suddenly becomes valuable. And it, that kind of like, also kind of like I think really echoes kind of things around kind of like how nature is being commodified and when something is kind of considered valuable or not valuable as often there's very arbitrary things um and yeah uh, so yeah this is again just another slide emphasizing how horribly environmentally um unfriendly these things are and then but just to kind of like finish um because i would like to kind of have time for questions and talk about things is that um when i started working on this project a lot of people kind of like would place the way that i would work in the lineage of kind of generative art because it's algorithmic but i think more and more i think it's it's more helpful to kind of think about working with these types of technologies in the context of land or environmental art because for me what I'm essentially doing is just setting up spending lots and lots of time thinking through and setting up all of the different variables and then making the kind of like making the the um, kind of conditions and then allowing something elements water plant growth um, you know, or in my case, a machine learning algorithm, bots, people to act on it, to create a piece of work that you can predict, but you can never control. And that for me is also one of the things that I enjoy so much working the way that I do. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a wonderful talk, for taking us in this journey uh, of multi-level stories, multi-level connections uh, that I think it opened up our mind to enjoy all your process and, and these pieces. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to see all the process behind uh, that probably a lot of people do not imagine. And I think I, I agree with you in, in how it's important to expose this. And we have some questions from the public. I will go first with them. Then I will like to ask some others. So the first one is, um, can you tell more about the process of creating a site virus? Is it still updating online or digital colleagues are not updating anymore? And what exists as documentation? Sorry, could you just repeat the question? It, it's yeah. yeah so, sorry. Um, so the question is about if mosaic virus is still updating, uh, creating new digital talibs, or if the work exists as a documentation. Yeah. 
So for blooming veiling, the kind of auction thing, that only exists as documentation. So that is kind of, that is something that I did. It was a finite period of time. It kind of exists for the auction that kind of like happens. So I put these kind of like very, very short clips on, people bid on it, and that kind of exists for 2019. For Mosaic Virus, which is the piece where it responds to the price of Bitcoin and is displayed in kind of three screens in a gallery space, that can be run um, to be live. So that could, I could switch it on and kind of run it live. But most of the time I choose to display it as a pre-rendered piece, um, mainly because it is um, very complicated to kind of run these things, lots of interdependencies. And also um, I think when you're showing something like now kind of like it would be fine because there's so much volatility in the market. But sometimes like when you're showing stuff that's live that is responding to stuff, you, there's always the risk that nothing happens. Um, and it just kind of like stays on one tulip for the whole time because the market's <laughs> not doing something. Um, so that, that's kind of how that those pieces work. Yes, I, I agree also from the part of curatorial perspective, it's much better to, to have the render if, if anything happens, yes. <laughs> it depends on the piece because like one of the things as well with the with the tulips, like when you watch them, you can't really tell how the Bitcoin is, is affecting it. Like it, like when you know, you understand and you watch for it. But um, so kind of like, the story is kind of like almost hidden, which also I quite like, just making a very poetic Bloomberg terminal that is essentially illegible. True. Okay, we have another question from Eva Mahali. Working on flowers on the subject of organic, what's your opinion about the ecological cost of blockchain-based transaction, the crypto art, MTF, etc. So I am very conscious of the environmental impact of kind of like of working with these things. It's why I kind of like um, I'm, I kind of like I'm very conscious of kind of like the materiality of what I'm working with. I think there is work that is being done in the space by people to try and kind of like think through how to kind of create a better model for NFTs. So kind of like proof of stake and stuff like that. I'm not entirely convinced by anything that's kind of come out yet, I think like, but there are movements like you, um, there are kind of people, activists who are trying to kind of create a space where the environmental impact isn't as traumatic. I think kind of for running my, so you've kind of got the environmental impact of NFTs, so kind of, and then you've got the environmental impact of kind of working with AI because like training models also use huge amounts of electricity to make. And I use renewable energy. I try and kind of like not run things needlessly. I always run stuff on my own computer so I'm aware I can kind of track more easily where the energy is being used from what type of energy I'm using rather than running it in a cloud and assuming that Google will take care of it. Um, but it's things like this where you kind of like, you, you can be conscious of it. You can also um, do things so like when I sell work, I put a percentage to kind of like rewilding and stuff like that. So I am very conscious of it and I do take it very seriously. And it's, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, you described the process of being with the tulips. Like I can imagine that also was a huge effort, like, you know, taking care, putting water because you need to take pictures, they need to still be alive. Uh, and also the relationship with the virus because um, you were also analyzing how the virus was affecting the, the, the flowers from a visual uh, approach does this connection with plants and virus in plants how uh, had an influence of your relationship with the virus of, of coronavirus the, the last year so yeah that's a good question i think <laughs> i don't think it has because i think ultimately like i think 
the virus kind of like that affects the virus that kind of causes the stripes is kind of like a a very kind of like contained thing i think maybe the virus the more the parallel i kind of like i think i've seen more this year with viruses is the kind of the more the kind of like contagious kind of like madness that sweeps through manias and speculative bubbles and kind of how like everyone just kind of goes like oh my god yes this 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 and this and that kind of mania that kind of virus i think you can kind of see in this past year but not around the coronavirus but more around disinformation around the coronavirus you see how kind of like information passes to people that the virus isn't real or it's caused by 5g or that kind of thing starts to spread and kind of become a bubble and kind of build and build and build and i think that i think is more of the parallel that i kind of more aware of around this kind of like collective mania that you get uh, that does spread it is contagious um yeah as, as you mentioned of painting the the soil around the tulips and like this kind of um, i i don't know how to sell it like uh, rituals that appear um yeah when when we don't know what is real when we are not well informed of what is happening um and uh, you mentioned in the beginning this um like inherent human perspective in AI mm -hmm. and a very awesome and good strategy that you are also trying to, uh, to, to do by constructing your own databases and being very uh, a good observer of what you are putting in the database. Do you think there is other strategies that somehow we could give more independency of AI or neural networks from human? <laughs> perspective it's um it's about kind of literacy it's understanding also what these things do and don't do i think kind of like one of the best ways to have agency about it is to understand it um a lot of the time what these systems do is actually not that impressive and it's the kind of people who kind of chain stuff together that make it impressive and i think kind of like by understanding that and by understanding kind of like what how, because when you also understand what it does you can understand how to break it how to get around it so you know like you can understand how to kind of subvert it by just understanding how it will break and so I think just kind of like not being scared of things and kind of like really getting into it um, is the best way to do things awesome thank you uh, do you see any other uh, future project with tulips Maybe. I feel like if there is ever a time to remake this and kind of do something with it, it is now with all of the craziness that is going on. Um, but I think, I think like this is the first year since making it that I've grown tulips in my garden. So maybe I'm ready to go back to working with tulips again. We're lo looking forward for any of your artworks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna. This has been very pleasant. Uh, thank you for receiving us in your home studio, our work. <laughs> uh, the community here in Russia is very happy to, to have this connection and looking forward to keep in touch. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to say goodbye to our live public. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>